Now, climate scientist Michael Mann has been one of the leading voices over the past two decades in the effort by scientists to raise the alarm about climate change. He was a lead author in the 2001 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report and has written four books on climate change and he joins us now in the studio. Michael Mann, welcome. So Thanks. just by chance, you happen to be here in the middle of this bushfire emergency. What do you make of what you've seen so far? Well, it's breathtaking and, and it's, um, you know, it's heartbreaking. Uh, the, the damage and destruction that's being done, the, the loss of uh, you know, uh, irreplaceable uh, forests and ecosystems, uh, the koala, uh, koalas that have succumbed to the fire. Uh, it's, it's, it's awful to be here um, and yet I feel like um, it is the appropriate time for us to be talking about dangerous climate change, because this isn't something far off in our distant future. We're dealing with it now here in Australia and elsewhere. So how strong is the link between climate change and this bushfire emergency? Well, back in the States, we have an expression, it's not rocket science. It, it's basic. It's simple. You take unprecedented heat, like we're seeing here in Australia, you combine it with unprecedented drought, which means that there is a lot of fuel available for these fires. You put those things together, you're going to get uh, the sorts of unprecedented bushfires that we're seeing play out. One of the notable things through this emergency has been this pool of hot air that has kind of been doing circle work around Australia. And I think we can bring up a graphic of that now. It's usually there, you can see the, uh, where it goes to kind of purple, it's above 45 degrees. That has been doing circle work around Australia for a couple of months now. It's usually the case that uh, a monsoon trough develops, comes down into Australia and breaks that up, but that monsoon trough has not developed. Apparently that's because of cooler waters in the Indian Ocean. What is the strength of the evidence of the link between um, th those cooler waters and anthropogenic warming? Yeah, well, cooler waters means there's less humidity in the air. So that contributes to the dryness that we're seeing. But there are these what we call dynamical mechanisms. There are things like El Nino. There are things like this Indian Ocean Dipole um, that reflect the natural variability of the system. And that natural variability is on top of the climate change signal. So sometimes it adds to that signal. It adds to the heat and drought like we're seeing right now. Um, th the point is that even in the absence of uh, changing uh, climate dynamics, whether or not the Indian Ocean dipole is getting stronger because of climate change or not, the basic factors, the heat, the drought, is why we're seeing unprecedented wildfires. The Australian government is adamant it's a responsible contributor to the global effort to limit warming. It's adamant it will reach its 2030 target of a 26 to 28 per cent cut on 2005 levels. How do you rate the Australian government effort? You know, unfortunately, they have not uh, been doing a great job. Uh, Morrison uh, was traveling uh, during, you know, vacationing in Hawaii during this unprecedented disaster that was playing out. And his administration actually played uh, a very damaging role at the recent uh, climate accords in, uh, in, in, in Spain. Um, uh, they sort of threw some uh, what we call monkey wrenches into the works um, and, and in, in effect, dampened uh, the atmosphere uh, for action on climate at this very important climate meeting. Yeah, so the Australian government wants to use carryover credits from the previous Kyoto period uh, to contribute towards achieving those goals in 2030. Um, if it, why is that not fair enough? Yeah, well, it's sort of like a, the medieval indulgences. <laughs> You're sort of asking for a free pass um, to uh, participate in destructive behaviour. In, in this case, uh, Morrison, the Morrison administration um, is behind the Adani uh, coal mine, for example, and that's going to double the carbon emissions from Australia from coal burning at a time when we need to ramp our emissions down dramatically if we're going to avert the worst impacts of climate change. We're actually seeing policies within this administration to incentivize the doubling down in our drilling for fossil fuels. What do you make of Scott Morrison's argument, though, that using those carryover credits is like uh, a mortgage on a house? They've, they've been putting down money on that mortgage for quite some time, so they're entitled to use that. 
Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's sort of, in my view, sort of playing accounting games. Uh, the fact is that we need to bring our carbon emissions down. It doesn't matter what the historical pattern has been. Right now, we need to ramp down carbon emissions by a factor of two within the next 10 years if we're going to avert the worst impacts of climate change. Um, and the Morrison policies are taking us exactly in the wrong direction. The, uh, the Prime Minister has repeatedly argued that Australia only contributes 1.3% of global emissions and it can't be credibly argued that individual actions of Australia are impacting on specific fire events. What do you make of that approach from a leader? Yeah, we, we've seen those sorts of arguments before. You see the same thing, for example, within the, the Trump administration back in the States that has uh, played, a, a, again, a damaging role in these international negotiations. Um, you know, it, it, it's this is a problem of, uh, that requires collective action. Each uh, country, each nation has a role in creating this problem. Uh, countries like Australia and the United States have played a great historical role. The, the cumulative carbon emissions that are causing this climate change are due primarily to industrial countries like the US and Australia. That means that those countries have to take a leadership role if we're going to set an example for developing nations that might otherwise say, well, why don't we get our turn at the carbon spigot? You've been uh, ringing the alarm for many years on climate change. Where are we at in terms of a tipping point now? Well, there is no one tipping point. There are many of them. And you might argue that we're seeing some of them play out right now. The heat and drought has now reached a point where we're seeing unprecedented uh, bushfires here in Australia, unlike anything that we've, we've seen here before. Um, and there's some evidence that there is threshold-like behavior. Once you make things dry enough and warm enough, you see a dramatic escalation in these sorts of wildfires, these bushfires. So one might argue we're seeing some of those tipping points play out right now. So what can we expect in Australia in 10 years time? What's, what's the danger uh, in 10 years time, if, uh, well, 10, 20, 30 years time, if the world doesn't act significantly to reduce those emissions? Yeah, well, you know, we're already seeing catastrophic impacts. You can imagine how much worse it'll be if we allow the planet to continue to warm, if we allow the continent of Australia to continue to dry out. This is just a taste of what's to come if we don't act. Mm. So is this the new normal? Well, it's worse than that. A new normal uh, implies that we've sort of settled into a new state and we just need to figure out how to adapt to that and deal with that. But it's more like a moving, an ever-moving baseline. It gets drier and hotter and the fires get uh, more e uh, extensive um, and, and damaging if we don't act. Okay, Michael Mann, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Thank you. It was a pleasure.